Hi, I'm Leslie Hayes, and I'm going to be talking today. I wanted to start just by talking a little bit about New Mexico Bridge, which is the project I did this under. New Mexico Bridge is a program to, it started off to try and um, get hospitals across the state with better policies around um, uh, treatment of opioid use disorder. And the idea is that um, we go into hospitals and, um, you know, help with any trainings that are needed, um, uh, resources that might be needed, um, help improve policies and order sets, things like that. Um, you can just go to New Mexico Bridge, nmbridge.org to see it, but there's a couple of things in particular I wanted to talk about today. Um, if you click over on the right, you can see engaged hospitals. I saw Mia Lozada here from Gallup Indian Medical Center. These are the hospitals we've engaged with so far, and I think there's actually a couple more um, that have engaged with us. But then under resources, I think there's some really great resources on here. And the first is the 24-7 call line. And this is just the New Mexico Poison Center, but they have toxicologists or addiction specialists available 24 hours a day. So if you have somebody who has a very hard induction to buprenorphine or they're using fentanyl and you're not sure how to um, deal with that, you can call the Poison Center and someone will get on to help you, um, uh, you know, give you suggestions and help talk you through it. Um, next under the resources is educational offerings. And um, here are just some things um, to get the monthly data 2000 waiver trainings if you're interested. They're no longer required, um, but I still think they're very useful trainings to do. Um, resources for your hospital. Um, in particular, there's uh, several things, uh, modifiable materials um, for your hospital so that you can um, look at these. Um, the talk today is going to be based on a document we wrote in Bolt's Basic Guide for Providers new to Buprenorphine Prescribing. And um, if you look at it, it's uh, um, just 20, uh, 29 pages. Oh, goodness, that's not where I wanted to go. 29 pages of basic guidelines on how to prescribe buprenorphine. And it's broken down into the following, and you can go to any of these uh, areas directly. Um, the DSM-5 criteria, the initial visit, home-based initiation, maintenance, dealing with bumps in the road, um, talking about the monoproduct or subutex, moving to a higher level of treatment, discontinuing treatment, rapidly managed um, withdrawal or detox, and then frequently asked questions. And I, I hope it will be helpful for all of you. And then the last thing is treatment and recovery support. And we're happy to put anybody else's program here if you would like. Um, these are just things to help uh, patients or family members uh, who are interested in learning more about opioid use disorder. And it includes um, the New Mexico Crisis and Access Line, um, the NM Connect app, which helps connect people to um, uh, behavioral health and a dose of wellness. So I think there's a lot of good resources on here that I would encourage people to look at. All right, and, and from here, I'm going to go into the talk. Um, since this is being recorded as a webinar, we're going to save questions for the end, but please put questions into chat or write them down and ask, um, and I'm going to try and save at least 10 minutes at the end for any questions that people have. So I'm going to start with talking about the initial visit when someone walks into your clinic and you're ready to start buprenorphine on them. Just some general tips, fairly obvious, be compassionate. Um, it's These people often have a lot of shame and there's a lot of stigma and being kind can go a very long way. I always discuss confidentiality, including the limits of confidentiality. I always tell people I'm not going to tell anybody about um, what we've talked about unless I find out a child is being actively abused. Um, if they're homicidal or suicidal, I need to notify emergency services. If their insurance asks for information, obviously um, I need to give it to them. And if I get a court order, I try to give the patient permission not to answer any question they feel uncomfortable with. And as far as taking the history, especially if it's a patient you don't know well, start with the really basic medical history. 
Next thing you'll wanna do is ask the drug history and then save questions for the consequences of drug use for the end once you've developed some rapport. And you can skip any of these questions if you don't feel like right now is the time to ask if you're just not getting a good bond with the patient or if they're very anxious. But generally start with the questions with less emotional impact first. You know, are you taking any medications? Are you allergic to penicillin? Um, before you start asking about have they lost jobs because of their drug use, things like that. And if you don't have adequate time to take a complete history, um, they walk in, you know, 15 minutes late, but they really want to start on buprenorphine. It is reasonable just to establish that the patient does have an opioid use disorder. They want to quit and they want to start treatment with buprenorphine and they have a safe place to store the medication and then have them return, you know, in two weeks when you've got time to do a full history. Hey, Leslie, it's Mia. I yes. don't know if you think that you're sharing slides right now. We can't see any. Really? Oh, bummer. Hang on. Let me exit and try this again. Um, you see them now? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm just going to real quick go through the slides. Um, I'm not going to repeat everything I said, but just, you know, I find it helpful to just look at stuff. So, so I'll go back to where I was. Um, so as far as um, history, um, when you're taking a drug use history, the things you might want to ask, how old were they when they started using? How much are they currently using? How are they using? Are they injecting, snorting, smoking, chewing, swallowing? How much are they using? How often are they using other drugs and alcohol? I find it's really helpful to ask what the reason for wanting to quit now is, because um, you may approach it a little different if the reason is just that they're spending too much money on drugs versus, you know, they've lost their job, their family, and they're currently homeless. Ask them what they've done in the past to quit using. Um, are they currently doing any counseling or meetings? Have they done counseling or meetings? Were they helpful for them? What was their longest period drug-free? How did they do it? For many people, this will actually be the time that they were in jail and prison. Um, have they ever tried buprenorphine? And if they tried it, was it off the street or was it prescribed? How about methadone? And um, did the methadone or buprenorphine work for them? Um, medical history, um, you'll ask them about chronic illnesses, um, psychiatric illnesses, surgeries, medications, allergies, and vaccines. Obviously you always wanna ask if they've been tested for HIV and hepatitis C and test them if they haven't been. Ask about uh, contraception and pregnancy. Uh, Ask them what their living situation is. This is really important. Make sure that their um, partner is, um, or the person, people they live with are supportive of them quitting. If they're living with somebody who really does not want them to quit using, it's very, very hard for them to quit. And then sometimes their partner is supportive, but they're still using. And if they are, you really wanna consider offering um, therapy to the people who are around them, just because it's very hard to quit when you still have people um, actively using in your house. Oh, the other thing is make sure they've got, or find out what their support is. Many people will have absolutely no support um, around uh, anything, you know, nobody that they can turn to if they need it. And those are people you really want to try hard to hook up with a peer support worker or someone else. Ask about their employment history. See if they have naloxone at home. Do they have a history of overdose? Um, See if they have children and are they living with a patient or not? And just be aware, this can be a very emotional topic for a lot of patients if they have lost custody. Um, so always be kind, never scold. It's really, really easy when you're talking to somebody and they tell you about losing their kids to be like, well, what do you expect? You were using cocaine while you were driving with the kids in their car. But these often, this is a huge source of trauma and you wanna be as kind as you can around this. And then, like I said, once you've sort of established rapport, asking about the consequences of drug use, medical, social, work consequences, things like that. Once you've gotten the initial history, then you've got to get them started on buprenorphine. And this is probably the most complicated part of treating people with buprenorphine. So 
the good thing now is at this point, most patients will have already tried buprenorphine on their own, and most of them will feel pretty comfortable with how to start it. If they have already tried it, you can usually just give them a prescription and let them start however they feel has worked for them in the past. So there's two different ways to start people on buprenorphine. The traditional way um, involves putting a patient into withdrawal and having them start buprenorphine somewhere between 12 to 24 hours later. I generally will ask my patients, how long does it take between when you stop using opioids and you start to go into pretty severe withdrawal? And you know, aim for some time around then. And then you'll just have them stop using. You wait 12 to 24 hours until they're in withdrawal. Um, you could, if you're doing this in the office, you can use the clinical opioid withdrawal score or COWS. I will sometimes print out a copy and give it to the patient. And usually you wanna aim for a COWS of around seven to nine. However, if they've been using fentanyl or methadone, those stay in the system for a lot longer and they're a lot harder to transition from. So you really wanna aim for a higher withdrawal score. Usually we aim for 13 to 15. Um, this is, you can give acetaminophen, you can give non-steroidals hydroxyzine, loperamide, clonidine, on dancitron to help with some of the withdrawal symptoms. And generally, you'll have them start somewhere between two to four milligrams. And um, I generally will start with four milligrams if they're um, using heroin or pain pills. If they're using fentanyl, I tend to start a little bit lower just because you can really precipitate, um, cause what we call precipitated withdrawal, which can be quite nasty. And you want to create the dosing schedule in collaboration with the patient. Ask them you know, how quickly they feel comfortable going up. You know, have they ever had a bad induction to buprenorphine in the past? And when you start it, you want, if their symptoms improve or stay the same, you know that you've waited long enough and the medication is unlikely to precipitate further withdrawal. So you can go ahead and have them take another two to four milligrams in 30 to 60 minutes and continue to take it um, every 30 to 60 minutes until their symptoms are resolved. If their symptoms get a little bit worse, um, you can have them take medication for their symptoms and take another two milligrams in 30 um, to 120 minutes and just continue to take two milligrams um, every 30 to 120 minutes until their symptoms resolve. If their symptoms get a lot worse, have them take the medication for symptoms and wait um, another two to four hours to take the next dose. Um, they can also take buprenorphine every 30 minutes, you know, and this is called macro dosing, where you try and get a lot of buprenorphine on board. This will eventually improve symptoms, but they may go through a very rough um, six to 12 hours doing this. Um, if you're having trouble with the induction, feel free to call the poison center. And you want to aim for a dose of somewhere between 16 to 24 milligrams on the first day. Um, patients using fentanyl may need higher amounts to control withdrawal symptoms. And if you are new to this, I would recommend try not to make your first induction be somebody off of either fentanyl or methadone just because those are much trickier and it can be really very difficult and a little bit scary. Um, people switching over from pain pills or from heroin, it's much easier to do this. Um, and Microdosing is what we're really going to, and I'm trying to do most of my patients with microdosing now. And this is officially off label, and there's really not been as much research on this as I would like. But what happens is you have them take very small doses of buprenorphine while they're still using and gradually increase it. You wait until right before they're about to use heroin in the morning and have them take a tiny, tiny amount. And the idea is they've already got some receptors that are open. The buprenorphine basically lands on those receptors and does not put them into any further withdrawal. And you gradually increase it over a week and they just gradually switch over from having most of the receptors occupied by heroin to having most of the receptors occupied by buprenorphine. And most of the time, by the time they get most of the receptors occupied by buprenorphine, they're able to completely stop on their own with really no withdrawal symptoms. This is most of the time much better tolerated by patients. It seems to be particularly helpful for patients transitioning from fentanyl. And again, there's a lot less research, but the research that has been done is favorable. It can be somewhat complicated. I definitely have had patients who just could not figure out how to do this. And here's a fairly typical microdosing schedule. So again, you wanna have them take the buprenorphine right before they would use opioids for the first time in the day or before using in the evening. 
So day one is 0 0.5 milligrams once a day in it. And I'll write for, um, I think it's 28 um, two milligram tablets or films if I'm gonna do this. It's a little easier if you're going with the films to cut it into smaller amounts. The two milligram tablets are kind of small and it can be a little challenging. So um, have them take a fourth of a two milligram tablet the first day. The second day, you'll have them take a fourth of a two milligram tablet, 0 0.5 milligrams twice a day. Day three, you'll have them take one milligram twice a day or half of a two milligram tablet. Day four, two milligrams twice a day. Day five, three milligrams twice a day, one and a half of a two milligram tablet or film. Day six is four milligrams twice a day. And day seven, 12 milligrams, and you can increase to 16 to 24 milligrams as needed. And this is a slightly different microdosing schedule, but I like the graphic just to kind of see how you're gradually increasing up to um, have them on a therapeutic dose of the buprenorphine. Maintenance treatment. So when you are giving somebody uh, maintenance, you've gotten them successfully on um, buprenorphine and you want to um, follow up and make sure they're doing okay. The first basic question is, are they taking the buprenorphine? And if they're not taking it, find out why. Were they not able to start it to begin with? Did they run out because they were taking extra or because they lost their script? Um, was it just not working for them? So, but assuming they're taking it, which most of our patients will be, ask them if it's effective. Are they having side effects from it? The most common side effects include constipation, nausea, and swelling in the hands or feet. Um, the constipation and nausea are fairly easy to treat. The swelling can actually be very difficult. I have not had any patients actually stop the buprenorphine just over this, but it can be hard to treat. It doesn't usually swamp well to diuretics, and it can be quite a nuisance. So it is something you might want to warn patients about. Are they having cravings? Um, Opioid use disorder is the, the cravings are really what keep people using. They have strong cravings that they're trying to satisfy. So um, finding out how their cravings are. Are they having any withdrawal symptoms? Um, drug use, are they using drugs? If the patient's answer is yes on drug use, you can ask the following questions. What was the trigger? And I find it's very helpful to ask, is it something internal such as anxiety or was it external? A friend showed up with drugs or a combination. A fight with the family led to stress and then they went out and they ran into somebody and that led to relapse. Because you will probably have different strategies if the trigger is internal. For instance, if they're having a lot of anxiety, you're gonna to wanna to treat the anxiety. If it's external, finding ways to avoid situations where they're gonna be around drugs. What drug did they use? Are they using opioids? If they're using opioids, you have to evaluate, is the buprenorphine effective for them? Do they maybe need a higher dose? Um, if they're using cocaine or methamphetamine, you're probably gonna need to go for a different treatment because cocaine and methamphetamine don't really respond to buprenorphine. Um, so getting them into um, a contingency management program or counseling or meetings, anything might be helpful. Find out if they got a response when they used. If they have buprenorphine on board and uh, they use heroin or pain pills, if they've got an adequate amount of buprenorphine on board, they should not feel high or get much of a response at all. Do they have a plan to avoid using in the future? Alcohol use can be particularly treacherous. Patients often don't really think the alcohol use counts because it's you know more social and it's acceptable and it's legal. And it's also much harder for us to test for alcohol. It's not gonna show up on an in-house urine drug screen. I haven't found one you can do in-house. And um, especially if they're binge drinking, you may not pick up on it at all. But alcohol is probably gonna be the most destructive of anything they can use outside of um, the opioids. It's really important. I ask every single visit um, how they store the medications. The medications need to be locked and hidden, and this is for two reasons. The first is that before we started getting really picky about this, every single holiday, I would have somebody come in and they had had their medications stolen. When their brother-in-law they thought they could trust came, or their cousin who they knew they couldn't trust but wasn't supposed to show up to the event had arrived and stolen the medications. And um, this is not something you want getting stolen, so it really needs to be locked and hidden for that. 
However, the other reason is that it's, this medication is extremely dangerous to small children. Um, one of my patients um, who was a good mom uh, had her child get into her buprenorphine. Um, she gave me permission to tell the story and the child did end up okay, she was about two. The mom was taking the medication and the phone rang. She turned away and turned back and that amount of time her toddler had picked up the buprenorphine bottle. She grabbed it out of her hands and counted and all the pills were in there. And so we think what must have happened is the toddler got powder on her finger and put her fingers in her mouth. So a tiny, tiny amount. They watched the child for six hours that day and she was fine. They took her to bed with them that night and 12 hours after the ingestion, she stopped breathing. They did CPR, they called 911 who came to the house, gave the toddler Narcan, got her to an ER where she was fine. But tiny, tiny amounts of buprenorphine are deadly for toddlers. So if there are small children in the house, it absolutely needs to be stored so that um, the kids cannot get into it. I always ask if they have naloxone in the home. Um, always ask about contraception. I try to ask for both men and women, um, but it is vitally important for women. 88% of pregnancies in women with opioid use disorder are unplanned. And it's really better if you can plan a pregnancy in anyone on, uh, opioid, with opioid use disorder get them on treatment, get them off any medications or other drugs that might be harmful. And no questions that can be useful. Just ask about their general functioning. How are they doing? Are they you know, able to take care of things at home? Um, are they doing meetings or counseling? I think this is really important to be asking about. Are they using seat belts? Um, there was a study of women who had had a baby in the, um, with neonatal abstinence syndrome. <laughs> And what they found was that there was a 10 times higher death rate over the next 10 years from almost all causes. But in particular, there was a 10 times higher rate of death from car accidents. And asking about seatbelts is a very simple thing to do. And I just hope it can decrease the rate of car accidents in um, folks with opioid use disorder. Ask if they have a job. I find having a job decreases substantially their likelihood of relapse. Ask about their living situation. Are there other people in the household who are using drugs? Is the living situation a supportive one for them? Ask who's supportive in their life. I have one patient who for two years, every time I ask who was supportive, she told me her dog and then her dog died and it was just awful. And she needed a lot of help during that time. And it, it, ask who is supportive of them. Psychiatric history, you wanna ask about anxiety or depression. These are very common in uh, people with opioid use disorder. And um, treatment of these can improve their life and I think can help them uh, uh, stay drug free. Ask how they're sleeping. Poor sleep can often be a precipitant of relapse. Urine drug screens. So until COVID, most of us checked urine drug screen with every visit. Um, when we were writing this document, I was a little surprised to find that the uh, two of the people I wrote it with did not check it on a regular basis. And um, what I have found out now with COVID is we're often checking it every six months or more. And I really don't know what the ideal interval will be once we're back in the office. Um, I do think it's very helpful to have in-office tests. They're cheap and easy. Results are available within five minutes. Um, they're nice because you can talk about the, with the results with patients right away. The send outs can often take up to a week. However, it's really important to realize they're not 100% accurate. They often lack sensitivity and specificity. They're generally useful as a tool and you gotta understand the limitations. The gold standard is chromatography with a mass spectrometer. These tests are available as a send out. This is also called the confirmatory test by a lot of labs. You don't really need these most of the time. Any unexpected results should be confirmed. And really the easiest way to confirm an unexpected result is to walk into the room and say, hey, your urine drug screen is positive for cocaine. Do you want to tell me about that? And if they say, oh yeah, I use cocaine at a party on Saturday night, you've confirmed it. There's no reason to spend the $100 to send this out to the lab. Um, if they say, absolutely not, I have never ever used cocaine, then you want to confirm the results um, by the send out testing. Um, so, and I put this in just because the other people I did this with, um, thought that this was a reasonable alternative. We did witness urine screens for a while and I did not like them. I thought they were dehumanizing. 
and very stigmatizing. And I won't do them at this point. Um, however, they are sometimes used and they can be um, helpful if you're getting results that you don't trust. The only time I would consider it is somebody who has been so dishonest with urine drug screens in the past that this is the only way I would feel comfortable keeping them on buprenorphine. But they need to be done with the patient consent. If the patient says no, don't do them. And you need to do everything you can to do it in a non-stigmatizing way that protects the patient's dignity. So some limitations of urine drug screens, they don't tell you when the patient used. They don't tell you how often the patient is using or they don't and they don't tell you how much the patient is using. Um, they don't tell you how the patient used. You don't know if the patient is snorting it or taking you know, Lortab as a pill or if they're injecting it. The tests don't tell you the patient's level of commitment to getting drug free. Even if they're showing up positive for opiates or other things, they may still really um, want to do this and um, be trying very hard. And most opiate tests are not gonna test detect oxycodone, which is a semi-synthetic, and you need a specific assay for oxycodone. You will never test, um, get um, fentanyl and methadone unless you specifically test for them. And um, buprenorphine always requires a very specific test. They will not show up um, on a urine drug screen for opiates. The other thing you wanna do with uh, urine drug screens is to test for buprenorphine metabolites. And sometimes a patient will put a tablet of buprenorphine in their urine because the urine otherwise would not test positive for buprenorphine. And this may be because they are not using buprenorphine and have weaned off and they're doing great. This may be because they're not using buprenorphine and they're using other opioids. This may be because they're using someone else's urine. And when they put a tablet in their urine, the in-office test is not very sensitive. It will show up positive either if the patient is taking buprenorphine or if they put a tablet in the urine. The confirmatory test will actually show the levels of buprenorphine and it will show the levels of the metabolites. And this is my first attempt ever at doing a um, diagram on PowerPoint. So I'm, I'm happy that I was able to do it. It's maybe not totally beautiful, but buprenorphine is the parent drug. That's the one that the patient takes. Um, in the body, it's metabolized to norbuprenorphine and then into norbuprenorphine glucuronide. Buprenorphine also is metabolized into buprenorphine glucuronide. So parent drug is buprenorphine. This is not very water soluble. You will not have very high levels of the parent drug in the urine just because it is not water soluble. Most of the parent drug, if it's gonna be excreted, is excreted in the feces. The metabolites again are buprenorphine glucuronide, norbuprenorphine glucuronide, and norbuprenorphine. These are much more water soluble. These should be found at high levels in the urine. So if the patient is taking buprenorphine, there will be a lot of uh, the buprenorphine metabolites, low levels of the parent drug. If the patient put a tablet in their urine, there will be high levels of the parent drug and no or minimal metabolites. Some labs will show all four separately and some of them will lump buprenorphine, glucuronide and buprenorphine together and then norbuprenorphine and norbuprenorphine glucuronide together. If the lab lists all four separately, you're gonna have a low level of buprenorphine and the other three will be high. If there are only two buprenorphine and norbuprenorphine, both of them should be high if the patient is taking it. So we're gonna talk about some bumps in the road that are common when you're treating patients with buprenorphine. So drug screens positive for non-prescribed drugs. First thing is, don't shame the patient. Most of the time, the patient is already quite ashamed that they used, and many are very worried about disappointing us. Encourage them to be truthful. Relapses happen in addiction just as they happen in other chronic diseases like heart failure or cancer. You would never yell at a patient because their blood pressure was too high. You know, yell at them about having uh, a relapse. Focus on problems with the treatment plan, how we can make it better. Ask questions about what happened. Was it a one-time use or are they using on a regular basis? Again, find out the circumstances of their use and ask if they need more support, such as counseling, meetings, peer support, anything like that. How about the patient who won't acknowledge use? Their drug screen is positive for methamphetamine. You've sent it out, you've confirmed it is, and the patient says, no, 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 I've never used methamphetamine. And again, because of the shame, a lot of patients are not going to acknowledge use. 
Many patients are also really worried that we're going to stop their buprenorphine if they acknowledge using methamphetamine. It can be very frustrating to us as clinicians when patients lie, but I really encourage you to work on your own comfort level with this. I think it's beneficial in general to just be able to accept that sometimes patients are going to lie to us and figure out what we need to change in ourselves so that they might feel more comfortable and, you know, sort of where you can help them so that they might feel more comfortable. Um, continued use is often a sign that withdrawal symptoms or cravings are not controlled. Um, and I encourage you, the other thing beyond being comfortable in the patient's lie, be comfortable with patients who are continuing to use. And just accept it as, you know, that things are not um, great for them yet as far as controlling their opioid use disorder and that we need to help them to um, figure out ways not to use. In general, you want to have a relationship where the patient feels comfortable talking to you about their drug use. It's also really helpful to understand that most patients with substance use disorders have been lying about their use both to themselves and to others for a very long time as a coping mechanism. So it may take a while before they that's not their automatic response. And then the other thing is to remember that many of our patients are not always truthful, not just our substance use disorder patients. I will have patients on blood pressure medications tell me that they're taking them every day and they have not filled them in nine months. Patients don't always tell me exactly what they're eating or how much they're exercising. Patients often lie because they want us to like them and they want us to think that they're working hard on their health and many reasons. They may be embarrassed. We need to extend grace to patients in these circumstances. And again, help make our offices a place where they are comfortable telling the truth. Drug screens with abnormal buprenorphine metabolites. So when we first started testing for these, most of the doctors I talked to had anywhere from 15 to 20% of our patients um, with abnormal buprenorphine metabolites. And it was quite a shock. And it's obviously concerning for diversion. When, this, when we first started testing, most of us would automatically discontinue the buprenorphine and it was assumed the patient wasn't taking it. And there are sometimes other explanations. They were embarrassed that they used cocaine and so they brought in somebody else's urine. You know, they were out of buprenorphine and just had one tablet left, so they used it um, to, for their drug screen. So talk about it with the patient, find out what's going on. And I definitely have had patients for whom this was a one-time mistake. I said, okay, you can't do this again. And we continued the buprenorphine and they've done really, really well. So I do discuss what the results showed. And if they acknowledge that they put a pill in the urine, find out what happened, why it happened. If they don't acknowledge it, make it clear, you know, your urine showed this and this is what this usually means. Um, and I think it's reasonable to give them, you know, a second chance. If they have recurrent urine drug screens that are negative for buprenorphine, you really need to evaluate whether you want to continue prescribing. Um, sometimes they may actually need the buprenorphine despite the fact that their urine has been repeatedly negative, um, in which case consider injections. Um, you may consider referring them for methadone or referring them for inpatient at that time. So treatment of pain in patients on buprenorphine. You want to maximize all the non-opioid treatments just as we would do for any patient, non-steroidals, acetaminophen, gabapentin and pregabalin, duloxetine, venlafaxine, and milnocipram, physical therapy, acupuncture, therapeutic injections, mindfulness. And if the pain isn't relieved by the above, the first thing that I would generally recommend is to increase the dose of buprenorphine to 24 milligrams a day if they're not already taking that and have them split the dose. You can generally have patients take the entire dose first thing in the morning if they're using it to treat opioid use disorder. But if they are also using it to treat pain, for whatever reason, you need to split the dose. It just works much better. If the pain is acute and not relieved by the above measures, you can prescribe opioids on top of buprenorphine. If for some reason, the buprenorphine is able to block the high, but it doesn't um, block the pain relief from the opioids. So, and I always make it clear this is a short-term measure only. Um, and if the pain is chronic and not improved by the above measures, you can consider referring to a methadone clinic, but be aware that a methadone, methadone is dosed solely to block cravings and block withdrawal symptoms. They are not dosing it for pain. In addition, methadone is only dosed once a day, and that is generally not gonna be a good way to do it for pain. You can also have a delay in being started. 
And you can also have a delay in getting to a therapeutic dose. Um, I have had uh, a handful of patients who have done really well with their pain once they got switched to methadone from buprenorphine. I do want to make it clear, no circumstances should a clinician put a patient they've been treating with buprenorphine on methadone. This may be viewed as a violation of federal law as methadone for opioid use disorder is only allowed to be prescribed in a methadone clinic. Although we can prescribe it for pain, if you have a patient you're treating for opioid use disorder, they are going to assume that you are treating them with methadone for the opioid use disorder. And there have been physicians who have gone to federal prison over this. If the patient is asking for early refill, ask why they need it. If they're overtaking it, find out if their dose is too low and adjust it if needed. This is probably the most common reason. If they've lost the prescription or had it stolen, make sure they've taken steps to prevent it from happening again. And I generally will do a refill at least once if this happens. If it happens recurrently, they need to take um, steps to prevent it from happening. They may need more frequent visits. They may need shorter prescriptions. Missed appointments. If they miss one appointment and it, you know they're generally reliable, I just send a script and reschedule the appointment. If it's recurrent, we need to figure out why and work with the patient on fixing the problem. If they don't have good transportation, see if they're eligible for transportation through their insurance. Medicaid in New Mexico will provide non-emergency transportation to appointments with a 72 hour notice. Poor executive function. These folks often just are not very good at organizing their lives. Um, you know, the, all of the steps necessary to scheduling an appointment and then making sure they have a way to get to the appointment and remembering what time the appointment is. They may not have calendars. Um, they may not have working phones. Um, all of this is very common. Counseling can help with this matrix group, which is a common uh, group for uh, people with substance use disorder, really works a lot on helping people with this um, organizing their life. Patients may feel shame or embarrassment about having relapsed and fear being scolded if they come in. So again, try to be compassionate with patients who have relapsed. They may have a fear of medical appointments or a history of medical trauma. This is unfortunately quite common in our patients uh, with substance use disorder and counseling can help with this. And then the last one is lack of commitment to treatment. And I think often when patients miss appointment, this is what we immediately jump to. Well, they just don't really care about, you know, doing this and they're not very committed to this. This certainly can occur. I think it's really important to rule out the above causes before assuming that's not why they're showing up, before assuming that is the reason they're not showing up for appointments. The fact that they are showing up at all is often a huge step in their wanting help. So pregnancy. If you have a pre pregnant patient or a patient who gets pregnant while on buprenorphine, do not stop the buprenorphine. Withdrawal is a terrible thing for pregnant women. It can put them into early labor, it can cause them to miscarry. And most importantly, it can cause them to relapse. And um, this can be really, really just devastating to a pregnancy. If you're not comfortable with the management, arrange for transfer to a prescriber who is comfortable. Write a script for buprenorphine um, without naloxone to last until they have an appointment. But please make sure that there is somebody who's gonna be taking over care of these patients. Send in a prescription for prenatal vitamins, and then really important, um, make a referral for prenatal care if you're not gonna be providing it yourself. Moving to a higher level of treatment. Consider moving to a higher level of treatment if the patient is continuing to use opioids while they're on buprenorphine and you really feel like you've gotten as good a dose as you can. The patient should be involved in this decision. I have patients who are still using heroin once or twice a week and they are thrilled with that. They've been using heroin for 30 years, you know, they were using six times a day. Now they're down to once a week. They just think this is the best they've ever done. And they are very, very happy with that. These are not necessarily people you need to move to a higher level treatment. This is pretty good for them. One time that they use is enough that they're like, I'm ready to increase treatment. I need to do something else. So possible higher levels of treatment. The first to consider is injectable buprenorphine. And this is useful for patients who do get some relief of their cravings and withdrawal symptoms, but not enough to completely stop using. You're able to get a higher level of the buprenorphine in the body using the injectable buprenorphine. It's useful for patients who struggle to take a pill every day. I find it's especially useful for patients who are really super motivated to stop while they're in the office, but then they skip doses in between visits and end up using um, because of that. 
Um, it's also a good option if the patient doesn't have a good place to store medication or if there are children in the house. And it can also be a good option if you're concerned about diversion. I have patients who I really don't fully trust to um, not sell some of their medications and getting them on the injectable buprenorphine means I can continue them on a treatment that has actually been useful for them. Methadone, as we talked about, can be useful in patients who have chronic pain, not relieved by buprenorphine. It's also useful in patients who are not getting good relief of cravings and withdrawal symptoms on buprenorphine. And I was at a conference once with somebody who ran both a methadone clinic and a buprenorphine clinic. And his comment was he had a lot of people in his methadone clinic who didn't get good um, treatment from buprenorphine and a lot of people in his buprenorphine clinic who did not do well on methadone. So you can't tell ahead of time who's gonna do well on one or the other, but methadone is a really good option. And then the other thing is inpatient. If a patient has significant psychosocial dysfunction, housing issues, they continue to use despite good doses of medication or they're on multiple drugs, um, consider uh, inpatient treatments. Discontinuation of treatments. First thing I wanna talk about the following are not reasons to stop treatment with buprenorphine. Pregnancy, pregnancy is never a reason to stop buprenorphine. Urine drug screen positive for illicit drugs is not a reason to stop buprenorphine. They've been on buprenorphine for a year or two years or five years, not a reason to stop it. And in addition, I find a lot of patients when they're first starting buprenorphine come in and tell me they wanna take it for three months. And if that's really what they want, I will work with them on it, but caution patients about discontinuing it early in treatment just because the rates of relapse are really quite high. And unfortunately, the rate of overdose is high. Rapid discontinuation of buprenorphine or detox is done frequently. It's rarely successful in helping the patient achieve long-term sobriety unless they're getting really intensive psychosocial treatment. It can actually increase their overdose risk because they'll have reduced tolerance and they may abruptly return to use after being abstinent for a period of time. And we really only recommend it in very specific circumstances, such as they're going to be incarcerated or they're going into an abstinence-based inpatient program. The usual detox is over two weeks, eight milligrams twice a day for two days, six milligrams twice a day for two days, eight milligrams um, a day, six milligrams a day, four milligrams a day, two milligrams a day, one, and then stop. We generally do recommend gradual discontinuation if you're going to do it. And this is for patients whose opioid use disorder is stable. They would like to get off the medication. They're at low risk for return to use or relapse. Evaluate their stability overall, their living situation, source of support, frequency of relapse, psychiatric and medical comorbidities, and their commitment to getting off. And what I do is I decrease by half a tablet every other day. So I'll tell them, just take half a tablet Monday, Wednesday, Friday, two to four weeks, and then at that time, go down to half a tablet less every single day. So if they were at um, three tablets a day, they'll be at two and a half Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and three for the rest of the week. And then they'll be at two and a half every day. And you continue doing this for however long as it takes. If they have mild withdrawal symptoms, these are common. These will generally abate without doing anything. Cravings are more worrisome. And if they're getting a lot of cravings, it's worth stopping and discussing whether or not to continue um, weaning the medication. And the patient should often be involved in the decision-making. They will hit plateaus where they just don't want to go down any further at that time. Um, the last few decreases are mostly the hardest. And it's really important to review the risk of relapse and decrease tolerance, including the risk of overdose. Make sure they have Narcan. I talk to them about, you know, don't use what you used to use because you will be at high risk of relapse. Make sure they know they can return to start buprenorphine and consider placing them on long-acting injectable naltrexone just to provide a safety net. And some frequently asked questions. What dose should I use and how much is too much? Generally, it's recommended to start at 12 to 16 milligrams a day. At somewhere between 12 and 16, you mostly have all of the receptors occupied and that's what we're aiming for. And then some patients who have been trying to stop prescription opioids can't get below 60 milligrams a day of oxycodone or hydrocodone, may actually do well at lower doses. Most patients do well with 12 to 16. Higher doses than 24 milligrams have not been well studied. Most of the time we think that they're not a benefit I have had occasional patients who did need more than 24 milligrams, but getting it from the insurance company can be very, very difficult. Almost no insurance companies will cover more than 24 milligrams a day. 
And for patients who really need more than that, switching to the injectable formulation can um, uh, be helpful because you do generally get a higher blood level. Referring to an outpatient treatment program, such as a methadone clinic, um, be, not fit for the methadone per se, but because they can uh, do a higher daily dose for buprenorphine. And tablets or films, some patients have a very strong preference related to the taste, how quickly it dissolves, being able to cut them in half. And most of the time their um, buprenorphine product will probably be determined by their insurance. And insurers usually prefer the tablets as the lower cost. All are available as generic right now. In general, I, used, I recommend using the film just because they're a little bit harder to get into for kids and it's a little bit easier for patients to adjust the dose, but whatever the patient wants, I think is, is reasonable. How often should I see a patient? Most of us generally see the patients weekly for the first four weeks, then every two weeks for four to eight weeks and then monthly. After a year when the patient is stable, we'll often go to every other month. If they're struggling, it makes sense to bring them in more frequently, but if I have a patient who is struggling, and they're you know, doing counseling twice a week, I'm gonna still probably see them monthly because I think they're getting you know, most of what they need um, from the counseling. Um, however, if you know, they're not able to figure out counseling or meeting that has worked for them, or if it's you know, during the time of COVID and there are just no behavioral health providers available right now, um, then you know, I will sometimes see them weekly if they need that level of support. Patient's urine is negative for opiates. Can I still start buprenorphine? Yes, if there's a history of opioid use disorder and the patient has a concern about relapse, often patients will come in and say, I'm getting divorced and I'm really worried I'm gonna relapse. Um, it's reasonable to start buprenorphine even if they're not currently using. You wanna start it in, at a low dose at that time, um, but it is perfectly reasonable. This also happens, I've seen it a lot in patients coming out of incarceration or patients coming out of abstinence-based inpatient programs. Patients rarely lie about having an opioid use disorder. If they tell you they've got one, almost for sure they do. And the other thing is their urine may be negative for opiates because they're using fentanyl, oxycodone, methadone, um, or buprenorphine. Should I require counseling for patients on buprenorphine? It is not recommended that you withhold buprenorphine prescriptions if the patients are not participating in counseling. It has good evidence for opioid use disorder with counseling and without counseling. However, that said, most patients are gonna get benefit from counseling or meetings. Actually, I think most human beings will get good benefits from counseling or meetings, but I think this is especially true for patients with opioid use disorder. And we can do things to encourage them to attend by allowing more time between our own appointments. Contingency management can be really good for this. Discuss regularly with the patient, find out what they would find helpful and knowing the local resources. My patient is using benzos or alcohol. Is this a contraindication to use of buprenorphine? The use of benzodiazepines or alcohol is far more dangerous in combination with heroin, fentanyl, or opioids. And so the FDA does recommend that you can prescribe buprenorphine in this situation, but they recommend monitoring carefully. I do think it's important to evaluate the patient for um, benzo use disorder and alcohol use disorder. If they are present, you might want to consider adding on medication for treatment of alcohol use disorders, such as gabapentin, acamprosate, or topiramate. Taking over the benzo prescribing with the goal of treating the benzo use disorder, gradually weaning down their benzo do doses. In general, we try to get patients off of alprazolam just because this one is so reinforcing and very hard to decrease and transitioning them to a longer acting one, such as clonazepam or diazepam. Um, you can also use gabapentin to stop the benzos more rapidly in a safe manner. And really with these, you wanna to connect to psychosocial treatment because both benzo use disorder and alcohol use disorder really do need significant psychosocial treatment. And how do I make sure my patient is not selling or diverting their medications? So it is impossible to prevent this 100%. So if you have a patient who's selling or diverting, don't feel like this is your fault. You should have done something different. Sometimes you just can't tell. But a few things that will help make it clear from the start that this is unacceptable and will result in discontinuation. Check the urine for the buprenorphine metabolites. Consider pill counts if there's a concern. Be careful using doses above 16 milligrams. Make sure there is a good reason. Use the combination product unless there's a good reason not to. And if there's a strong concern that they're diverting, but they also seem to do well on buprenorphine, change them to the injectable buprenorphine. And I believe that is all I have.
All right. And I'm going to go ahead to the questions. 